We live in a world that is struggling to find true hope. We know that because suicide rates are up. Prescription medications for depression are up. People are constantly um, down, complaining, whining, angry, etc. It's because all of us have been created with this, I think it's an innate, kind of God put it in our heart, um, this desire to be able to trust in something solid and secure that we can hope in, that can take us on forward into the future. And we put our hope in governments. We put our hope in medical achievements or in our spouse or in our kids or in our status or in our job or in our retirement. So there's, there's so many things that we choose to put our hope in. The problem is with placing our hope in these things is that all of these things at some point are going to disappoint. All will let us down. None of them are worthy to be the object of our hope. We can use these things. We can enjoy these things. We can even love uh, some of these things, but they should never be, and were never meant to be, the object of our hope. Only one thing is worthy to be the object of your hope. And that one thing is the person of God. The person of God. You were created, and God placed within you when he created you this desire for an object of hope, and he is that object. I want you to listen to something that the psalmist said in Psalm 33 Starting in verse 20, he said, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. You see, the psalmist understood that his hope had to be in God. He had placed his trust, his security, and his hope in the Lord. In the Lord. The Lord was his source of hope, his source of strength, his source of joy. There's another passage that promises strength and peace from having God as the object of hope, and that is Isaiah 40. So navigate somewhere in some either device or in your Bible this morning um, to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah was a prophet of Israel. It's an Old Testament book. One of the largest books in the Old Testament, 66 chapters. Interestingly enough, these chapter divisions were not created by God. They were created by men. Um, They correspond very nicely to the 39 chapters of the Old Testament, the themes in the 39 chapters of the Old Testament, and the 27 chapters of the New Testament. So starting in Isaiah 40, and for the next 27 chapters, the themes of salvation, deliverance, Redemption, etc., are played out. And Isaiah 40 is kind of the, the introduction to that. And it begins um, in, a, in a very strong and powerful way by lifting up God. But look at the very end of the chapter there. One of the most famous verses, if you have been a Christian for very long, you have heard this verse. And maybe some of you who are not Christians have even heard this verse. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That word wait there is used 89 times in the Old Testament. And it is translated in a variety of ways. It can mean to look forward to, to await, to expect with confidence. And many times it is also translated hope. Waiting is kind of a confident expectation, right? Or hope. When you're, when you're waiting for uh, someone to pick you up, you're hoping they're going to arrive, right? You're waiting confidently. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and you're supposed to meet somebody there and like five minutes after you're starting to question whether or not you're, you're still sitting there because 
you really hope they're going to come through the door soon because the wait staff is starting to feel sorry for you like somebody stood you up. But you're hoping that they're going to come in and sit down. And that's, that's what this word means. It's a confident expectation. It's the idea of hope. And within the, for those who find their hope in the Lord, who are hoping in the Lord, God says that he will renew their strength. So here's something. If you're, if you're taking notes or if you're just trying to remember something today, I want you to remember um, this. That, and just think of it this way. My strength for today can only come from hope in God. My strength to face today, to face the disappointments of today, to face the discouragements of today, to face the fallenness of this creation that we live in, The disappointments could be a a job that doesn't pay enough to pay your bills. It could be the death of a loved one, the discouragement, the despair that is in that. It could be a sickness that is long-term and ongoing, maybe even acute. And there could be this loss of hope and hopelessness that has entered your life. But know this, that today God wants to strengthen you to face each day in the hope that resides within him. That hope that we place in him as the, our, his, the object of our true hope. So, the, so this morning, I want to walk through Isaiah 40 with you. We won't have time to look at everything in detail. But Isaiah 40 reveals so much about who God is. So much about who God is and what he Uh, wants to do and promises for his people. So this morning I want to draw to your attention to some of its main points so that you might leave with greater strength to face today, that you might leave encouraged and filled with hope because your eyes are off of the thing that is not worthy as an object of your hope and your eyes are now upon God as the only object worthy of of your hope. So look at the beginning of Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Right off the bat, we see that the first source of strength for you is in God's tender promises. The first source of strength for you is in God's tender promises. Look at, at verse 2. He promises peace. He says, Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. This is a nation that is known warfare constantly battling. I mean, if you were here in Sunday school this morning, Michael was talking about a time after the writing of this in which the nation had gone through war and had lost the war and had been taken into captivity and God's people, in the book of Esther it's revealed, and God's people face extermination. They are constantly in this state of anxiety and God says there is a time in the future that I want my people to be comforted With this idea, I want you to speak tenderly to them about this truth, that their warfare will be ended. God says, I promise you, there will be a day when there will be peace. There will be peace. And I don't know about you, but I yearn for peace. I mean, my home is not a place of turmoil. My job is not a place of turmoil. But when I read the headlines and I look at the things that are happening locally between groups, all I see is fighting, battling, anger. Nowhere do I see peace. I see ideologies and conflict. I see people, and sometimes families, torn apart because of this. I don't know about you, but I yearn for peace. God promises you and he promises his people that one day peace can be known by them. It is this tender promise in which we are to hope. Not the the calming effects of substances. Not finding, you know, um, looking for peace by satiating our desires and pleasures. Trying to, to soothe that kind of roiling within us, not as escaping what is happening in the world, but the peace that God promises. 
This is a tender promise of God to his people. Look back at verse 2. There's another promise here that we want to gain strength from, hope in. He promises pardon. Look at what he says there at the end of verse 2. He says, that, tell, he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now you might read that last part and think that means she received double punishment for all her sins. That's not how God rolls. God never sets a punishment and then doubles it you know, just on a whim. Like, hey, it's going to cost you twice as much as I said it would. That's not, what it, that's not what it means. And it can't mean that because the words before us tell us that it doesn't mean that. He says, tell Israel that her iniquity is pardoned. And it wasn't, it wasn't that just enough had been paid for her iniquity. It was that more than enough had been paid or will be paid for her iniquity. There will be a day when more than enough will be paid for her iniquity, for her sins, for what she has done Against me. And if you've read the first part of the book of Isaiah, the first 39 chapters, you have heard the charge of God against his people. They have continued the rebellion of all mankind against God. They have spurned him. He calls them an adulterous lover. They have they have done everything to dishonor the name of their God, the God that they are to be in covenant relationship with. They have sinned mightily against God. And God says, speak tenderly to my people and let them know that there will be a day when their iniquity will be pardoned. And it won't just be enough. It will be more than enough. An abundance of pardon for their iniquity. That's something that as believers in Jesus Christ, we can draw hope from. We can draw hope from the promises and be strengthened by the tender promise of God in pardon. There's something else he promises in verses 3 through 5. He promises his glorious presence. It describes the coming of this great king, this God, as he, it says, prepare the way of the Lord in verse 3. Excuse me. At the end of verse 3, it says, Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He's talking about the coming of a great king. In those days, there were many paths through wilderness areas to get to various towns. You know, you've seen a path before that has been well-traveled. You know, it could be a foot or two feet wide. But no king could travel down that path. No king would come down that path because he'd have maybe hundreds of people with him. And probably he's riding on some kind of cart or carriage it wouldn't be wide enough and so when a king wanted to visit an area people would be sent to clear the path and to make a wide roadway so that all of the king's people could travel with him to this town to this village or to this city and so God says one day my presence will dwell with you one day I am coming this is a a text that was used in the new testament um, by John the Baptist that he was one crying out in the wilderness, prepare for the Lord's coming. You know, prepare for the Lord's coming. And he, he recognized the one who was coming. It was Jesus. He knew that, that, that Jesus was, come, was the one whom God was sending eventually. But this was, this was a declaration by God to his people that I will not be distant from you. You will not be separated from me. That a pathway will be made and I will come to you. That his glorious presence will be with them. He says that in verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And not just you, but all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The first source of strength for you is in God's tender promises. And he promises his peace. He promises pardon. He promises his glorious presence. And fourthly, he promises his loving care. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. This he here is, is the God who is being revealed by Isaiah. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. You see, I, Isaiah is using a lot of word pictures in this text to, to 
paint this picture of God and who God is and what he has promised and what he will be about. And he promises to give us his loving care, his attention. He will tend us. He will give us attention. He's not too grand that he could care less about us. When the day of fulfillment comes for all of these promises, the ultimate fulfillment of these promises, God's attention for his children will be great. There will be no one child that is like, that's the runt of the litter. I could care less about him. No, he will tend you. He will give attention to you. There will be a closeness. He says, I will gather my lambs in my arms. You can just imagine a flock of billions and billions of people. And God says, I'm able to gather all of them together. That's how, that's how great I am, how massive I am, how infinite I am. And each one of them will feel close to me, will feel attended to by me. And then there's a gentleness communicated here. This, this great God is also a gentle God. He says, I will carry them and gently lead. The picture of God care, gently carrying you close to his bosom is meant to, for you to see a shepherd carrying a little lamb a, a, a very fragile creature close to his heart, right? That's what God says he wants to do with his children, that God wants to do um, for his people. The first source of strength for you is in God's tender promises. So if you're writing something down, I'd, I'd like you to write this down. I am strengthened by my hope in God's tender promises. I am strengthened by my hope in God's tender promises. When you place your hope in the promises of God, then you find strength for the day. You can face the day that offers discouragement. You can face the day that lacks plenty. You can face the day that it will be full of pain. You can face the day that has discouragement. You can face it when your hope is in God's tender promises. But there is, there is more to Isaiah 40. And we are just scratching the surface here. There's a, there's a second source of strength for you. And that second source of strength for you is in God's sovereign greatness. Look at verse 12. Isaiah begins to describe this God who would come and gather his lambs. This God who promised to dwell with his people and come to them. This God who promised to pardon their iniquity. He speaks of this God now in his sovereign greatness. And he says, God is greater than all creation. God is greater than all creation. Verse 12 says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in the scales and the hills in a balance. He says, who has done that? No man can do that. So the implied answer is this God that I'm speaking of is the only one. He is the one who has done this. He's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. That's how immense he is. Can you imagine all of the waters of the earth filling a hand? It's meant to speak of God's immensity, his greatness. He marked off the heavens with a span. You know what a span is? It's the distance between your pinky and your thumb. You know what God said? Let me just, I, I'm gonna, if I were to measure the universe and if I had a hand, it would be, you know, maybe between my pinky and my thumb. The universe, not the galaxy, not our solar system, not just the size of the earth itself, the universe. This is the enormity of God. He's greater than all creation. Look at verse 22. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. It's like, it's like God is using the earth for his footstool, right? And he's just watching the grasshoppers, who that's us, on the earth. That's how enormous God is. That's how much greater than all his creation he is. And then look at verse 26. Isaiah paints another picture for us. Lift up your eyes and see who created these, the stars. These are the stars he's talking about. 
who, he who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Not one is missing. Do you know how many stars there are in the universe? Does anybody know that? I don't think anybody really knows. But I think they say there are 126 known, 126 billion known galaxies. And each galaxy could contain up to 300 billion stars. Um, that's a lot of stars, right? Like tens to trillion or trillions and trillions of stars. And it says, oh, and it's, it's God who brought these out. It's God who created these, is what Isaiah is trying to get across. And he created them in his power. And all of them are right where God wants them to be. No star goes supernova that God didn't want to go supernova. It is right where they want them to be. And God has names for all of them. I mean... I, I have a hard time remembering all of the names of some of the kids and some of the bigger families in our church. And frankly, just to be very honest with you, I don't remember most of them. I can usually get the oldest two. I'm lucky to, re I'm terrible with names. I'm lucky to remember the parents' names, and I can usually get the oldest two, and then it is like, you know, and, and this week at junior camp, there was this girl, she, this was her third year there. And, and I, here's, here's my curse. I am great at noticing patterns. Like, I can see patterns. I, I recognize things that I have seen before. And, I mean, I can see just a glimpse of something and know what it is and where I've seen it. So it's a curse when someone walks up to me and I know their face. And I know, I know this girl's face. And she's so bubbly. And every year, she wants me to remember her name. She doesn't go to Countryside. She, she doesn't go to Redemption Hill. She's the cousin of someone who goes to Countryside. And she came up to me during one of the games, and she was dropping her little ticket in the bucket. And she goes, hey, Paul Blue. And I go, hey, good job. And she goes, do you know my name? <laughs> and I'm like, ah. And she got this look, and she goes, it's Melody. And she turned around and stomped off. And I'm like, okay, I... I am going to make sure, I should have taken a picture of her, right, so that I could put her name like on my wall, and it's like when junior camp comes next year, if I'm there, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is walk up to Melody and go, Melody, so good to see you. I, I, could her, I couldn't remember her name. God knows the names of all the stars. He named them, and he doesn't forget any of them. He knows them intimately, easily. No astronomer could point to a star and say, um, hey, God, what is that? And you go, hmm, let me, I mean, it would be out of his mouth the minute his fingers started heading towards it. God knows that. He's greater than all his creation. There's something else, though. He is greater than all counsel. Look at verses, verse 13. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Meaning, who is it that's actually kind of evaluated God? Who is it that's measured the spirit of the Lord? And what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? The implied answer there is no one. No one. God is greater than all counsel, all wisdom, all knowledge. I mean, when you, th when you think about the knowledge that we have in this book, the psalmist says in Psalm 119 that knowing the law of God, and that was just the law of God, okay, that you might call uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, just knowing the law of God made him wiser than all his teachers. You know, this book doesn't even begin to contain the sum of God's counsel and knowledge. I mean, it is like, it's not even like one star in the entire immensity of the stars in that universe. That's how wise God is. That's how knowledgeable God is. He's revealed a ton of it to us. In fact, there's probably no one in this room who knows everything in this book. And what I've said is that God knows infinitely more than he's able to reveal to his finite creatures. And that should give us hope. Right? That should give us hope. What we don't know, God already knows. 
What we don't understand, God perfectly understands. What we can't reason out, God already, he knows the path. He can direct. He, he is greater than all counsel. And then finally, he is greater than all the nations. Greater than all the nations. Look at verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. I love the word pictures here. And are accounted as dust on the scales. To, if God had a big scale and he were to actually take all of the nations of the earth, and I, I think there's over 200 and some nations right now in, in the earth, and he were to take all the nations and put them on the scale, they would amount to nothing. They'd be like a, some dust on the scale. They wouldn't move the needle one little bit. You wouldn't even see it just move barely at all or shake. It would mean nothing to God. It couldn't move his scale. They're like a, a drop of water in a giant bucket. You know, imagine, imagine the biggest, a five-gallon bucket dripping one drip of water. That's like all the nations of the earth, you know, to God. He is greater than all the nations. He's also greater than all of the rulers of those nations. Look at verse 23. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely are they sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. God's saying, I'm greater than all the nations, I'm greater than all the rulers of all the nations. You think there are some great and powerful people? They're like nothing to me. I raise them up and I tear them down. They, they, they have a momentary flicker of what they think is greatness and I snuff them out. I read an, an illustration of uh, there was a, a great king in France. I think it was Louis the, Louis the something. There were a lot of Louis. Louis the Eighth. Anyway, he ruled for 72 years in France. And he thought he was awesome. In fact, he had commanded that at his funeral, there was to be a single candle. All the candles in the cathedral were to be snuffed out except for the candle to be carried by the one giving the sermon, and then a single candle on his coffin. And this was, this was great, what this servant of God actually did. He walked into that room. Okay, so you've got all these people mourning this great king, and he was known as, he called himself Louis the Great. All right, referred to himself that way. The first thing that man did was walk over to that candle snuff it out and say these words, only God is great. Only God is great. Louis the Great would not even be a gnat circling the head of Almighty God. God is greater than all these things. The second source of strength for you is in God's sovereign greatness. So if you're taking notes, write this down. I am strengthened by my hope in God's sovereign greatness. In fact, Isaiah says in verse 18, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare with him? Nothing. The enormity and immensity of the universe, the knowledge of the greatest computer that we could ever build, if we could build a quantum computer that could fill every inch of the universe. It couldn't know what God knows. Nothing is to be compared to God. He is to be the object of our hope. You know what's amazing about all these themes? They are all summed up in one person. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You guys, for those of you who attend here, church here regularly, you probably know this. Because J.D. has been teaching through the book of Colossians. You probably know that Jesus Christ is preeminent over all creation. I mean, that's what Paul said in Colossians 1.16. He said, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. All of Isaiah 40 that refers to 
God being greater than creation is summed up in Jesus Christ. God is greater, I said God is greater, Isaiah has told us that God is greater than all counsel. And yet, in chapter 2, if you remember this, speaking of Christ, it says, In whom, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see, people want to tell you that Jesus was just a man. But at camp this week, we emphasize that Jesus was totally God and totally man. And in him, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are summed up. So that God is greater than all the nations, but Jesus is the king of the final kingdom. And it says in the word of God in Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 says this to God's people. That we are to give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And he has delivered us from the dominion or kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of Of his beloved son. Jesus will be the final king. There will be one people. And they will serve King Jesus. And all the nations will be as dust to him. Oh yeah. God's tender. Or God's sovereign greatness is all summed up in Jesus. But you know what? The tender promises of God have also been summed up in Jesus. Remember that promise of peace? That promise of peace? I think J.D. just got done preaching about the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts, right? In the church, the peace of Christ controlling the way we respond to one another, that the turmoil that is the human race is not to be a part of the church because we have the peace of Christ. We have peace with God and now we have peace among or can have peace among one another because of what Jesus has done. It's all summed up in him. The promise of his presence, right? The promise of his presence is also all over the New Testament, right? The promise of his presence, what did... Let me see here, I have a a reference here. When Christ, Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So for Isaiah, it was the shepherd gathering his lambs, carrying his sheep in his bosom. In the New Testament, it is promised that you will never be without Jesus. That he will always be with you and you will be with him in glory. So the promise of his glorious presence is yours forever if you know him. And the promise of his loving care. Now I I probably could have searched something out in uh, Colossians, but I I didn't want to because I wanted to find I wanted to use this verse from John. Jesus said this from John chapter 10. Because it it speaks to the illustration that um, Isaiah used, the word picture that Isaiah used. Jesus said this. He said, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. He said, I... Whoa, I need a little bit more magnification here. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. And my own... Know me. There's attention. There's closeness. There's gentleness. There's love. There's sacrifice in Jesus Christ. Then I missed one. He promises pardon. He promises pardon. In Colossians chapter 1. Again in verse 13. Paul said he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, you can't walk away from here this morning and say, Isaiah 40, hope in God. I've got a God. I've got a God of my own creation, of my own making. I've got this image of how God should be. You can't do that. Because the New Testament also tells us that all the promises of God 
our yes in Jesus Christ. If you want to just love a nebulous God and you want to ignore Jesus Christ, then none of those promises belong to you. There can be no strength and there should be no hope. All the sovereign greatness that we would love to attribute to some nebulous grandfatherly figure in the heavens that is never, has never really thought anything poorly of us at all. All of the greatness that we would like to attribute to that creation, that figment of our imagination, is all summed up in Jesus Christ. And if you don't have him... If he is not the object of your hope, then you don't have pardon. You don't have the forgiveness of your sins. You see, God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross so that he could pay the penalty for your sins. And he willingly went. Remember what he said? I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. It is in me that you have redemption the forgiveness of sins. If you will place your hope in me and in nothing else, not in government, not in money, not in success for my children or success for myself, not in some God that I have imagined in in my own making, the God that I'm comfortable with, the God that never offends me, if you put your hope in the revealed God, Jesus Christ, and the redemption that he offers then you can be freed from the despair. You can be freed from constant disappointment, dissatisfaction, and you can find strength to face each and every day. Each and every day. Our strength for today can only come from our hope in God. Our strength for today can only come from faith in Jesus Christ. Hope in Him and in Him alone. He is the one that that prophet was pointing to. And Jesus said, I will come again. And let me just say that if he comes today and your hope is not in him, it will be too late. There is no second chance. He's not going to set up a platform and start preaching and call people forward or call people to receive him. He will simply judge and he will gather his lambs. To him. Are you prepared for that? Is he the object of your hope? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We are here because we want to know you. We are here because we are interested in finding satisfaction in this world, and we have something in us that draws us to a place like this. And God, we know that you have revealed that's because it's in a place like this that you are magnified and that your son is lifted up. God, I pray that you would drive a grand vision of your greatness and your tender promises deep into our hearts. And this week, even starting today, Lord, we might find ourselves taking our eyes off of the objects in life that are not worthy of our hope or our trust and putting our eyes onto you and your tender promises and your sovereign greatness and resting in your loving care. Father, I pray that for these people. I pray that for myself. I need it, Lord. I need to be redirected moment by moment by your spirit. Do that. God, I pray for anyone here this morning 
who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, as their hope, that you would open their eyes and draw them to yourself. May they come to understand what it means to be free, to be forgiven, and to have hope, true hope, lasting hope, and a solid, standing on a solid foundation, foundation of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that in the name of your son's great greatness and power and glory. Amen.